Well, good morning. It's good to see each one here this morning. We're glad that you chose to be with us this morning, that we can all worship God together this morning. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate those that are watching us online as well. We ask that you can come out and be with us if the opportunity arises that you feel like you're well enough or safe enough at this point to come join us. We would appreciate that. There's a few uh, announcements this morning. So on our prayer list, let's continue to keep Lisa Robertson in our prayers. She has a torn tendon in her foot and will need surgery this week. Please keep her in your prayers as she waits for her surgery. We got word that Miss Nancy Smith uh, is not doing well. She is a uh, former member here. A lot of us know Nancy real well, so let's continue to uh, keep Nancy in our prayers. Carrie Ray recently had gallbladder surgery. She is home recovering. Let's continue to keep Chris and Carrie in our prayers. Let's continue to keep Miss Francis in our prayers as well. Uh, Tim passed away early Saturday morning. The funeral arrangements for Tim are as follows. The visitation and funeral will be Thursday, March 17th, here at the building. Visitation will start at 1 p.m. and the funeral will be at 2 p.m. If you can help with food for the King family, there will be a meeting down front after morning service. So if you can help with food, just plan on being down front one side or the other after services, Derek says over here. And uh, we'll talk about that because the church is going to feed the family at that point. Let's continue to keep Donnie Morgan, Nick Romano, Brenda Bracey, it's good to see Brenda this morning as well, and Julia Lewis in our prayers as they deal with some ailments as well. There will be a teen parent meeting today following the morning services. Let's say that'll be over here. Food, meeting for the youth over here. Last, the leaders practice today, 3 p.m. Bible Bowl, 4 p.m. speech, song leading, and Bible reading. That's today. Standing in the gap is tomorrow. That's formerly the men's meeting that occurs on Mondays as well. March 14th at 6.30 p.m. Please sign up on the uh, bulletin board if you can help bring sides, drinks, and desserts. Ladies' Day, March 19th at 9 a.m. The guest speaker will be Emily Hatfield from Henderson, Tennessee. If you would like to help with Ladies' Day, please sign up on the list in the foyer. I've said this several times. If you need something to do, go through the foyer. There are several lists out there, and you know we would appreciate you getting involved with that. Ukrainian Mission Relief, it's on the front of our bulletin. It's also on round. These are items that you can bring to the building, and we'll find a uh, spot for them. I think Derek said we're putting them downstairs right now, and we'll make sure that these items get to the proper place. These are items that are needed for that relief. Uh, over the next several weeks, we will be collecting supplies to help those in, the U in Ukraine. All items donated need to be placed in the downstairs fellowship hall, designated areas for that relief. If you would like to make a monetary donation, please write your checks to the Sidewell Road Church of Christ. And in the memo line, earmark them for the Ukrainian mission relief. And so in a couple of weeks, we will be taking these supplies to the Holly Springs Church that is taking care of the distribution for these items. If you need more details, please see Derek Broom or Kayla McAdams. Teen devotional, March 20th, following evening services. The teens have a Fear Factor night on March 25th. Uh, we will also be hosting the area-wide devotional Sunday, April 3rd, and we're collecting Easter eggs still. The Easter egg hunt will be coming up uh, April 9th. Continue to bring those, and Car Care Group 2 meets tonight in B1. I believe that's all of our announcements. Uh, at this time, we'll have a prayer for the beginning of our service. If you'll go to a meeting and God in prayer. 
Lord, we're grateful for this day, and we're thankful for all the blessings you give us each and every day, Lord. Most of all, we're thankful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for our sins and the cross that he bore for each one of us, and for that we are grateful. We're thankful for each person that chose to be here today. We ask that those that are not here or chose not to be here, that something will be said, something will be done to change their heart, that they would want to be here with us as well. Continue to be with us through this service as we individually and collectively present our worship to you as we lift up our prayers, as we lift up our voices and we break the word of life as Gary brings us a lesson that we will be attentive to what is said and that we will listen and live it in our everyday lives and that we will take it out and tell others about it. We're grateful for those that were in our classes this morning as we dig deeper into your word. We were studying this morning about the need to reach out like Jesus does to those that are lost and to those that need to hear that word. And I pray that that is something that we think about doing each and every day. Continue to be with us as a church. We're thankful for the church, and we're thankful for Sidewell Road and what it means to each one of us. We're thankful for the efforts that we use here to spread your word. We're thankful for those that work in those efforts. We're thankful for Gary and Derek and Logan and the efforts that they make and the deaf ministry that we have with Ed as well. We're grateful for them as they work with us. We're thankful for the eldership here, and we ask that you be with us as we try to further the work at this church. Give us strength, give us courage, and give us wisdom to do that. Continue to be with the deacons in their areas of worship, and as they help us to conduct this service, and as they help us conduct the needs of this church, and we ask that you let us as members look to them for areas that we can help in. We ask that you continue to be with this country and the leaders that we will look for ways for peace and that our leaders will look for ways for this country to be unified. Continue to be with our military here and our military abroad and keep them safe. Continue to be with those that are sick. Continue to be with those that I mentioned this morning. Continue to be with those that have lost loved ones, Lord. Be with Miss Francis, especially as Tim has passed on. We know that we're just sojourners in this world, and heaven is our eternal home, and that's what we look forward to. And it's our prayer that you take care of her as Tim has moved on to that eternal home. Continue to be with us through this service. Continue to let us listen and continue to... Let us look to you for strength. It is, in our, it is in your name that I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first song will be 506. 506. Tell me the story of Jesus Christ.
Scripture reading and prayer this morning will be in our folders. It will be B63. B63. We'll sing the first two verses and then the chorus, and then the third verse, and then the chorus after that. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and Friend. will come from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, from the New King James Version. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on the gates. Go with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day to hear about a lesson about your word. Please, please pray for the King family. I know they've been through a lot. Um, with the loss of Mr. Tim, please pray for Miss Lisa and all others on the sick list. It's quite lengthy, so that I know that they could use your almighty healing powers. Uh, please pray for our first responders and soldiers fighting overseas, the sick and the shut-in. And please allow us to go throughout our lives and take what we learned today and use it to further your kingdom. In the name we pray, amen. This morning, if you're using a songbook and need to mark the invitation song, it'll be 718. 718 will be the song after the lesson, and before, we'll sing 120. 
120. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. If you will, please stand. experience first time in my life just just not too many weeks ago I was invited to speak on the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship that's not unique but the title of my lesson shocked me uh, at first it's uh, the role of older men in the church and I thought I gotta find some to talk to and then I thought about it and said, well, I guess I am one of those. And uh, I began to think about, well, why would they give me that assignment? I mean, besides my age, why, what would be the motivation there? And I've gotten, because of you all and others in the past, I've gotten to go a lot of places. I get to see a lot of people. I've been California and Oregon and all the way over to New York, Pennsylvania, all down that that side of the country, and people sometimes ask me, what is the number one thing the church needs? And I'll tell you my answer. We need to know how to read the Bible and understand it. Now, years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say that nearly as much, because we were not just a, a Bible-loving people, we were deeply involved in the Bible in the study of the Bible. But in recent times, it appears to me that we have allowed all the busyness of life to push the Bible into the background. You might say, well, how's this relevant to me? I'm going to tell you how it's relevant. I've had people both in their living room and in my office with tears streaming down their cheeks. I don't know what I'm going to do. My children don't follow the ways of God. They don't even have any interest in the ways of God. 
Brethren, understanding the Word of God, being able to see it for what it is, is most important to the Lord's people. That's why we're going to talk about the way that Jesus and his disciples interpreted the Bible, because it is a specific type of teaching and, and instruction and interpretation that they did use. First of all, I want to talk about Jesus, and particularly uh, how that Jesus answered the Sadducees with a single text out of Scripture, or if you prefer, two verses out of that one text that we're going to talk about. As we get into this study, I think we need to understand something first about the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the spirit world or in life after death. Or you could say they didn't believe in the resurrection, and that would be just as accurate. The Pharisees believed in the spirit world, and they believed in life after death, but they had a unique twist on that, something you might not have thought of because of the further teachings of Jesus. They believed that marriage continued in eternity. Not just that you would know your wife, but she'd still be your wife. Or not just that you'd know your husband, but he'd still be your husband in eternity. That's the view of the Pharisees. So the Sadducees, as you'll see, looking in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 28, came up with a hypothetical case that disarmed the Pharisees entirely. They didn't know how to deal with it. They used the law of leveret marriage. I'm not going to read those passages for you. I'm just going to talk about them. If you look up, for example, in Genesis chapter 38, you'll remember the story of a woman by the name of Tamar. Tamar married the firstborn son of Judah. He did something so wicked that God put him to death. Don't know what it was, doesn't matter. He was put to death. Well, under the law of leveret marriage, which, by the way, this precedes the Mosaic law, so that's of interest because that shows the law was in existence before then. Under the law of leveret marriage, Judah gave his secondborn son to Tamar so that she could have a child under the name of her first husband, the now dead husband, and his name would be perpetuated. His brother didn't like that idea. And so, without going into graphic details, suffice it to say, he found a way not to have a child. God struck him dead too. Because he didn't honor the law. Now Judah had a third son. He was too young to get married at this point in time. And so Judah told Tamar, go back to your daddy's house and stay there until it's time to marry this boy. Problem was, that boy reached marriageable age, and Judah didn't give that boy to Tamar. And so Tamar came up with a very unique way of resolving this situation. She ends up having children by her father-in-law. Not to his knowledge, he didn't know who she was but he does end up having children by him. And thus we see demonstrated the law of leveret marriage. Now, it is repeated in the law of Moses, and you'll see that in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And so they came to Jesus with that as a background, and here's what they said. There was a, there was a family that had seven boys. The first boy married a woman. He didn't have any children. He died. So the second boy married the woman. He didn't have any children. He died. Third boy married her. No children. Died. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. They all married her. They all failed to have children. And they died. And so then they say, now, whose will she be in the resurrection? Well, for the Pharisees, that's a problem. Because basically she'd be married to seven fellows in the resurrection from the Pharisaical point of view. 
But Jesus answers really with two approaches. First of all, he refutes their argument by his own authority. Look at Matthew chapter 22, and now I want to look particularly at verses 29 and 30. Listen to what he has to say. You are mistaken, not knowing the Scripture nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Well, how does Jesus know about that? Well, he's from heaven. He's heaven come down to earth. And on the basis of his authority, on the basis of his knowledge, he says, you don't understand the resurrection at all. In the resurrection, there won't be any marriage. Instead, we'll be like the angels. Now, by the way, you might pigeonhole that in the back of your mind because that serves to resolve a problem sometimes presented about the book of Genesis where some people say angels married women and had children. Not possible. Angels do not have children. They don't get married. Not possible. How do I know? The Lord told me so. And so there's the resolution for it. And that, doesn't that point us immediately to something we need to teach our children? When God says something, it's true, not just today, it's always true. When God speaks the truth, it's not a flexible truth. It's unfortunately, we live in a society, we live in an age in which truth seems to be flexible. Not so with God. That's important to remember. But then Jesus gave a second part to the answer. And listen to that, beginning in verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying... I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus answers their whole position by using the tense of one word. I am. Now, for those of you that keep these notes and pack them away, my typist made a mistake. It's not verse 16, it's verse 6. Okay? So you may want to make that little change there. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 15. I wondered why I put verse 16 before verse 15. Well, it's because I made a mistake. Or at least my typist did, who happens to be me. But anyway, so what have we got here? I am the God. Now see... Under the Sadducee's point of view, what we have is that when you die, you become nothing. And so here is God speaking to Moses. And by the way, this is in the first five books of the Old Testament, which the Sadducees followed very explicitly. They weren't too big on the rest of the Bible, but they loved the Pentateuch. They loved the law. And so he goes to the law, the very books that they use. He goes to chapter 3, and God says to Moses at the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, what did God just say under Sadducee thinking? I'm the God of nothing. Because when you die, you go into nothingness. You go into oblivion. Now, obviously, God is not the God of nothing. God is the God of everything. And so when he says, I am the God of, he's saying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. Now, they're not on the earth, but they're alive. Now, if you want to see support for that, look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Because there we have the rich man in that story talking to, guess who? Abraham. Is he alive? Well, very much so. He talks. He answers. He knows lots of information that's very important. Yes, he does explain things very, very clearly. 
So I believe there are a couple of lessons that we need to learn from this already about the interpretation method of Jesus. Number one, Jesus believed in plenary verbal inspiration. I know. Plenary is one of those words that you learn when your mom and daddy send you to school to learn them. How about if I said that this way, every word? It's verbal. Every word, plenary, all of them are inspired. And Jesus zeroes in on one word. Now, brethren, that's important for us to understand because it says to us what? You want to know what God thinks? Read his book. He's made it clear. He's let it be known. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17? All scriptures, God breathe. Give my inspiration of God. That's the idea. God spoke. But then the second thing that I think that we learn here is that Jesus believed people could read the Bible and understand it. Your children can understand the Bible. You can understand the Bible. I'll go a step further. Your friends and neighbors can understand the Bible, and we can all understand it alike. We've got to quit letting people say to us, we've got to challenge this view that the Bible is not understandable. That's false. The Bible is perfectly understandable. We just need to read it. And we need to read it without our colored glasses put on. Some of our friends out in the religious world put on colored glasses. They'll say, well, my preacher said, I don't care what your preacher says, and you shouldn't care what your preacher says either. If it's not in the book, it's not right. If it's not in accord with the book, it's not right. And you ought to challenge me on it, or whoever, if we teach something that is not in the book. So, Jesus answered the Sadducees by using one text, and particularly one word out of one text, which demonstrates to us it's understandable, and every word is inspired of God. But then, Jesus used all of Scripture to teach about himself. In Luke chapter 24, we find actually two stories. This is in, involving the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He's now raised from the dead. These two disciples, one of whom is unnamed, the other is named, and we'll see that in the story. These two disciples walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's not very far. Jesus joins them on the road, but they don't know who he is. Their eyes have been clouded over somehow, so they don't know who he is. And they're walking along. Guess what they're talking about? Well, what would you talk about? Jesus was crucified on Friday. He was in the tomb Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning. Some of the women said, he's alive. We've had a vision of angels, and they say he's living. And these fellows are talking about it. And Jesus turns to them as they walk along, and basically he says, uh, what are you fellas talking about? And in our terminology, they said, where have you been living these last few days, under a rock? You don't know what's been going on? And they began to tell him about the very things we've just talked about how that the one they thought was going to be the Messiah, he's going to be the king that's going to lead them in victory over Rome, and they're going to dominate the world, that that very one was put to death on the cross of Calvary. And that they buried him. And now, well, now today, some women are saying that an, the angels told them he's alive. Jesus' response to that comes in verse 25 of Luke chapter 24. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. Boy, wouldn't you like to have heard that sermon? I would. I'd like to have heard Jesus go from Genesis all the way through Malachi, showing the passages that deal with him. And that's what he talked to them about along the road. He demonstrated to them what? A type of interpretation. You know what it is? It's called the inductive method. It's not important that you remember that, but it's important you remember how you do it. The inductive method is taking everything that Scripture says about a particular subject, reading it all together, and coming to a conclusion as to what Scripture teaches. I'm going to tell you what the Old Testament teaches from beginning to end of the Old Testament. It teaches that the Messiah is going to come, he's going to be put to death, he's going to be laid in a tomb, and he's going to be raised from the dead. Paul argued that again and again in the book of Acts, starting in Acts chapter 13, I might add, and going right on through all the missionary journeys. That was the point that he made, and he made it from Scripture without fail. Now, it is kind of interesting to see what happens next. Because it, it causes us to see something very important. Verse 28, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. Okay, now wait a minute. What do you think of when you hear that, when you read that? Opened eyes. Well, previously they didn't know who he was, right? For whatever reason, however God did that, they didn't know who he was. But now their eyes are open. They see. Keep that in mind. Because read on just a little bit further. Their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Now watch the next verse. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? He, he opened their eyes. How did he do it? He went through a whole Old Testament talking about himself. And for once they saw what God had been saying for generations. Now, what would you do if that happened to you? I can tell you what they did. I don't know what they went to Emmaus for, but all of a sudden it's not very important because they go running back to Jerusalem. <laughs> and when they run back to Jerusalem, they come to the disciples. And as they come there, they tell about what happened. Now then, beginning verse 36, Jesus appears to the disciples. And listen to what he says. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they'd seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now, he further confirmed it because he said, You all have anything to eat? That's put in my words, but you know what I'm saying, right? And they gave him something to eat, and he ate. And then, beginning in verse 44, here's what happens. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. If you divide the Old Testament up, what do you have? Well, effectively, you have the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. That's what you've got. God's Son had told them. How, when did he start telling them? You know, it was very early on that he said, I've got to suffer and die and be raised again. It's very common for him to talk about it. They didn't hear it. They didn't want to hear it, I don't think. And I'm not sure I would have either. 
But now he goes through the entire Old Testament showing them or has shown them what this means. And watch verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Now, all of a sudden, these people who have been grieved because Jesus died on the cross, now all of a sudden they should know why he died on the cross. And now listen to what he says next. Thus it is written, that's what he's been talking about, right? And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance or remission of sins should be preached in his name among every nation beginning at Jerusalem. What did he do? He took everything the Bible had to say about himself. He showed death, burial, resurrection were necessary, and now it's your job to tell the world. And by the way, he got that out of the Old Testament too. That all nations are going to be invited to the mountain. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. It's just one example of that. Jesus looked at the Scripture, and when he looked at the Scripture, what did he see? He saw that it was something we should go through and pick everything that dealt with the subject, come to a conclusion, and tell what it is. Now watch. Peter got the message. Peter reasoned about Judas' replacement, who must be chosen. We're talking about Acts chapter 1. You remember that after Jesus ascends, they're told to go into the city and wait because power is going to come from on high. The Holy Spirit's going to come, is the idea. And while they're waiting, we find the Apostle Peter dealing with these matters. And particularly, he, he talks about Judas and how that Judas was numbered with them. He was one of the twelve. But that he betrayed Jesus, and that after he betrayed him, that, that he purchased the field. Now, that's an interesting way of putting that. Because he didn't purchase the field. He threw the money into the temple. But the money that was his was used to buy this land. What land is it? Well, Judas fell headlong and burst asunder. I'm trying to be delicate. Some of you won't be able to eat lunch if I get more explicit than that. Okay. So they bought this field, and they made it be the field of blood, a keldama. And they buried paupers there. They buried people there that didn't have any plots to bury folks in. Now listen to, to Peter as he then begins to explain, verse 20, for it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Well, I don't know anybody lives in, in the cemetery. Do you? No. So it's going to be an empty place, right? That's what he says. But, and that is a quotation from what? That's a quotation from Psalm chapter 69, verse 25. Then he says, and let another take his office. And that's from Psalm 109, verse 8. Now what's he doing? Everything that talks about Judas and his empty office and the need to fulfill it, he's just quoted the two verses that have anything to do with it in all of Scripture. I didn't say he quoted everything about the betrayal, because that's not true. But he quoted everything that has to do with the office. He's drawing a conclusion. What's the conclusion? We've got to pick somebody to take his place. Who'd they choose? Matthias. And we see that written. In the, in the remainder of this chapter, and he's numbered with the 11. Now, last of all, I want to look at how Peter explained the events of Acts chapter 2. Remember, Jesus said, go into the city and wait until power comes from on high, till the Holy Spirit comes. Well, they did. And on the day of Pentecost, which what day is that, by the way? Well, you count 50 days, seven Sabbaths, that's 49 days, right? Seven times seven, isn't that still 49 weeks? Okay, that's what I thought. Old math, I know it is, okay? Seven times seven, 49, and it's the day after. What day is that? That's the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day, the Spirit came down, and all the apostles were inspired by the Spirit to be able to speak in languages they'd never studied 
And people gathered around, big crowd came around, and everybody's kind of looking at each other, and each one's saying, well, I hear them, he, they're talking in my language. They're, they're saying exactly what I was born in, you know, English, German, French, whatever it was. We're all hearing it in our native tongue. And then folks began to try to find an explanation for it. And somebody came up with this explanation. Well, they're, they're, they're drunk. You know, I've got to admit to you, drunks kind of have a language all their own. But if you record it and play it back to the drunk the next day, even he doesn't know what he said. And Peter indicates to them very quickly, no, these men aren't drunk. How do you know they're not drunk? Because it's just 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, for us, that doesn't mean one thing. But it did for the Jews. Because on a feast day, and Pentecost is one of those feast days, nobody eats or drinks until the day has started with praising God. And that began, I guess when? About 9 o'clock in the morning. So, they're not drunk. Hadn't had an opportunity to be drunk. But instead, now watch him. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. The one that talked about this in detail, the only Old Testament prophet that talks about the day of Pentecost in detail is Joel. He quotes from chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, and when he gets to the end, it's verse 21 in Acts 2, it says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Peter seizes on this opportunity, and he begins to talk about Jesus. Now, these are Jews in front of him. What's he going to do to convince them that Jesus is the Son of God? He's going to use Scripture. And he's going to search through the Old Testament to find things that support his position. Listen to him, beginning verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. Now wait, stop just a minute. He didn't quote the verse, but he was laying it out. That's Isaiah 53. God knew they were going to kill him. Isaiah 53 makes that very plain. Continue, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now, pause. Why did Peter not tell them about Isaiah 53 and the death on the cross that was foretold? Because they all knew he died on the cross. What was it they didn't believe? He's raised from the dead. That's what they didn't believe. So the rest of his sermon is all about what? The resurrection. And now he's going to zero in on passages that talk about the resurrection. Listen to him. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was made glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. In that passage, which by the way, is a quotation from guess who? David. Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. In that passage, what did he let them know? Number one, he's going to die. Number two, he's going to be buried. Number three, he will not see corruption. Now, we need to know a little background here. The Jews believed that the body began to decay on the fourth day. So what did God say through David? I'm not going to leave him in the ground longer than three days. How long was Jesus in the ground? Not longer than three days. He came up on the third day, raised from the dead. Did that fulfill prophecy? You know it did. And demonstrated what? Well, Peter's going to tell us. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. 
Brethren, it's time we read the Scripture and use our minds. That's what Peter's doing here. He's saying David wasn't talking about himself. Well, surprise, surprise. How do they know that? Because his tomb's right down the street. Everybody knows where David's buried. He's dead, and he didn't come out of the tomb. So who's David talking about? Well, Peter's going to reason that out. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Why do you think Matthew went to all the trouble in Matthew chapter 1 to tell us that Jesus is a descendant of David? Why do you think Luke, in Luke chapter 3, went to all the trouble to let us know Jesus is a descendant of David? I'll tell you why. Because David was saying, a seed of mine, a great, 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 great grandchild of mine is going to be raised from the dead. That's what he was saying. And that's what Peter's arguing right here. So listen to him. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. In other words, he's going to come up before the fourth day, right? He'll come up on the third day. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Don't you love it? Peter's tying the whole thing together. You all want to know what's going on here. Let me tell you what's going on, he says. Joel told about it. God's raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus sent the Spirit just like he promised, and just like Joel said he would, and that's what's going on here. Now watch him, because he's not through yet. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. By the way, that quotation is from Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. God said, I'm going to raise him up, and I'm going to put him on the throne. Is he the Messiah? Well, where do Messiahs sit? On thrones. He's on the throne. Where? In heaven. That's where he's on the throne. The kingdom's come. It's here. And who got the keys to the kingdom? Oh, Matthew chapter 16. Some guy by the name of Peter. He's got the keys, Right? And he's going to use those keys. Listen, therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's the king. That's what Peter declares. Well, now they're hurt. I mean, they're hurt because they know what they've done. They've put to death the Son of God. And so they cry out and say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And watch Peter. Now he pulls out the keys out of his pocket. And what does he say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's happened here? He used the inductive method to talk about how that the Scripture had anticipated Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And that the events of the day of Pentecost were clearly a fulfillment of prophecy, which means Jesus is on the throne. How do you know he's there? Because he, he made the call, I got safely here. That's the way we do it, right? You go on a trip, we've had people leave our house, especially women at night, will say, would you please just text us or call us when you get there so we know you're safe. Well, how do we know Jesus got to heaven? Because the Spirit came. That's how we know. That's what he said would happen in John chapter 16. The Spirit came. They were empowered. They preached the truth. And what did they declare? Jesus is the Son of God. And what are you going to do about it? Well, if you want to be saved, you're going to repent and be baptized. Brethren, we can teach our children to understand Scripture, but first we better learn to do it ourselves, hadn't we? Jesus believed the entire Bible was inspired. We demonstrated that from one passage that he used in talking to the Sadducees. Jesus used Scripture, all of Scripture, to teach his disciples about himself and the two on the road to Emmaus, as well as the apostles. And then Peter. Peter used Scripture to determine that 
Judas' office had to be fulfilled, and that Jesus was raised from the dead. All that was demonstrated quite clearly. Have you seen the truth today? If you've seen the truth, Peter's already told you what to do. Why don't you do it now? Come as we sing. this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 370, 370. couple passages and scriptures this morning. Um, first one being in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses um, 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 13. 
Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And then I want to turn back to Romans chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, talking about this indescribable gift. But the gift is not like the trespass, for the many, for many died by the trespass of the one man. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin, for judgment followed one man, one sin, and brought condemn, condemnation. But for the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day, Lord. And we, we think back about that indescribable gift that you sent down, Lord, that he allowed himself to be beaten, spit upon, Lord, and that crown of thorns be placed on his head. He allowed himself all to suffer all this torture, Lord. And as we think back now about that body that you sent to us and um, help us take this bread that represents that body in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, and likewise, manner we think back about that precious blood that was shed for us, Lord. So hopefully one day we take advantage of that blood and we can spend eternity with you, Lord. And uh, we think back about how you gave that gift to us, Lord, and since your son Jesus shed that precious blood, and let us take this cup and manner well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's really good to see each one here today, and we appreciate you being here with us. If you have anything that needs to be announced or put in realm or on the bulletin, be sure that you're getting that information to the church office or to Derek, and we'll get it out there. If you're needing prayers or family members are needing prayers, let's make sure we get that information to us. I have a couple more small announcements. Uh, Charles says the mowing team schedule is on the table in the foyer, so if you know that you're on a mowing team, make sure you pick up one of those schedules. Obviously, we know spring's coming, grass going to start growing, and we're going to need your help as well. So we appreciate these guys. I was handed a note, remember Ladies' Day is this coming Saturday, so make sure that you remove any items from the pews to prepare for Ladies' Day. So if you keep things on the pews that makes you more comfortable on Sunday morning, make sure that uh, we remove those items just for this one week and you can bring them back with you next Sunday. So as a, Derek does a great job of getting the announcement sheet ready for us. And sometimes as I'm going through the announcements, I may say something or forget something or you know, it's, it's kind of a lengthy list sometimes, and we want to make sure that all the information is getting put out there. But 
we have a group of people that you know are not physically able to be with us and they're considered as our shut-ins and uh, you know my parents are part of that group and we have others that are part of that group as well and Miss Nancy is also part of that group. I think I may have said former member. Miss Nancy's not former. She is part of our shut-ins. So I wanted to make sure that I, I corrected that, that we love Miss Nancy, and she is still a part of us. She's just not able to be here with us like I'm sure she would like to be. So as we finish up our service, let's stand for our closing song and our closing prayer. Our last song this morning will be 545, 545, we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Men, don't forget there's a sign up uh, list in the back and in, in, uh, in the foyer out there for tomorrow night uh, for things to bring, so if you don't mind checking that and sign up to bring something. 545. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. to give there's boxes in the back um you can put your deposits in um or checks cash whatever you want to give and you can give on the realm app or you can mail um your contribution to the church office let's have our closing prayer dear lord we're thankful again for that indescribable gift that you gave us lord and we think back now and as we give as we prosper this week, Lord, we ask you to we give some of your money back to you, Lord. Uh, we do it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight um, with a cheerful heart, Lord. And we help, uh, help us to be diligent in utilizing your money, Lord, and help us to do it in an efficient manner, Lord. We ask you to be with the ones that are traveling this week, Lord, uh, whether their own um spring break lord or just the regular travels to and from work or whether traveling to get to the services of the ones that have passed lord we ask you to be with the king's family as they're traveling this week lord and we ask you to be with the ones that are tending to miss nancy and help her to get back to her um way of life lord that would be comfortable to her lord and we ask you to be with us this week um as the different seasons start to change lord and we're thankful for the ones that have um took taken the time lord to get yourself ready so we can cut your grass lord and we're thankful for mr bracy and all that the braces mean to us all the both the different families charles and antonio lord and we ask a special prayer and you help miss brenda to get back to her normal walk of life too lord and be with us this, today and as we go home and come back this evening and study another portion of your word and we're so thankful for the ones that have prepared lessons from your word lord and 
thankful for the ones that taught Bible classes and all that they do, Lord. We ask you to forgive us when we fail you and as we forgive others. In Jesus' name we pray.